the world's first electronic computer. In one second, the computer can perform more than one million arithmetical operations. Advanced microprocessors, like the 286 or the 386. Potential Y2K computer crashes top the list. And we are calling it iPhone. It's part of a popular movement in the technology industry. It's called cloud computing. And you'll see why 1984 will be like 1984. Hello, and welcome to Magnetic, the history of computing. This is episode four, fun with electricity. I'm going to take some time in this episode to hop around looking at some really interesting inventions that played a major role in the development of the electronic computer. You'll probably find this episode very interesting and I guarantee a few ah moments. So let's get started. It's the turn of the century, the last one before the millennium, and inventions are coming out in huge numbers. The inventions are all a mishmash of various things that the inventor and scientific community probably got really excited about, but us common folk went, meh. The year is 1904 and everyone is going crazy with the glass bulb. Thomas Edison had invented the light bulb just 20 years earlier, but in doing so discovered some really weird phenomena that happened with the glass bulb. One of the things he and his scientists noticed is that when a filament inside the bulb broke, a black smudge would appear on the positive side of the filament on the inside of the glass. He added a small metal plate to that part, and after trial and error, ended up connecting the plate to a separate power source in this case a battery. With this new configuration, he discovered that he could control the current to the plate based on if the plate was positively or negatively charged. He patented this as a voltmeter. Years down the road, some of his former employees and other inventors were inspired by this new technology and started down a path of aggressive invention that led to several major breakthroughs. John Ambrose Fleming was a former employee of Edison and took it upon himself to invent a diode for use in radios. A diode was exactly the same as a voltmeter, but used in a different way. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the vacuum tube. This quote, invention of Fleming's, sparked a huge race and example of one upsmanship between Fleming, inventor Lee DeForest, and inventor Reginald Fessenden, who was suing DeForest for copying an idea of his. DeForest basically reinvented Fleming's idea, just in a slightly different way and without coiled wires. It's a bunch of drama that resulted in an audion. Other inventions were a result of this, such as diodes and triodes, and with a little magic from a student named Howard Armstrong, the triode was strengthened and became the gold standard. There was an excellent explanation of this from Kathy Loves Physics on YouTube, and I'll put the link in the description so you can hear her explanation. The way we look at output from a computer was born around the same time as these tinkerers were playing with bulbs. It seems like the big inventor fad focused on injecting electrical currents into glass at the turn of the century. Around this time, we found another person playing with this stuff, and his name was Carl Braun. Carl is a guy who was in circles with Fleming, DeForest, and those guys, and he himself actually discovered a way to alternate current between transistors, which was pretty amazing. But that's not why I'm mentioning him here. He did something else that was incredibly important, inventing something that was used not only in computing, but in the military, and eventually in houses across the country. He invented the cathode ray tube oscilloscope, which by about 1905 started to become all kinds of things, a radar, audio output, you name it, as long as it had to do with the powered display, he was responsible. Carl took cues from a previous invention, the X-ray. He found that X-rays are generated by cathode rays, which you can only get when you apply a high voltage into a vacuum tube. He took this concept and set it up like this. Envision a small spiral wire. That's a cathode. He shocked it with a lot of voltage at the end of a small tunnel, 
forcing the energy to go into a small beam, becoming a cathode ray. Then he sent the cathode ray through a positively charged electrical field, and it created a direct stream of green light that was then sent to the bottom of the glass cone he had attached to the glass tunnel. If you haven't seen a cathode ray tube, envision a beaker with a big battery at the top. The immediate result is a beam of green light into the glass. It was pretty amazing. Fast forward to 1926. Philo Farnsworth had been working on an idea he had had for the last six years, which was a cathode ray tube that received an image from a camera, which then transmitted the image across radio waves. It was live television, and the best part of it is that it used the invention of the cathode ray tube, or CRT for short, in conjunction with Farnsworth's new invention, the image dissector tube. The tube is one that captures high contrast light as an image onto a coating of cesium oxide, which then emits electrons kind of like a mirror. It was that image that was transmitted over existing radio waves and scanned onto the CRT televisions at home producing an image. Problem solved. I got a sidetrack for a second. Because as much as I love computing and electronics, I also love a good scandalous story. And this one gets scandalous. You see, while Farnsworth was working on this invention in Philadelphia, a man named David Sarnoff, president of RCA, caught wind of this and got excited thinking that it'll be the future of radio. He attempted to purchase the system rights from Farnsworth, who then turned him down. A company called Philco, however, was more than happy to work with Farnsworth. Philco licensed the patent from Farnsworth, which would give him a good amount of money each time Philco manufactured products using his patent. This was it. Farnsworth would be set for life. However, back in New York at RCA, Sarnoff was stewing over the no answer he got from Farnsworth about licensing and began pouring tons of money into building a system that rivaled Farnsworth's. Sarnoff's team had a hard time getting their invention to work, so Sarnoff did what he knew how to do, win. Sarnoff did business with Philco too, so he ended up telling them that RCA would no longer use their patents as long as they were working with Farnsworth. This meant that Philco would lose a significant amount of money and eventually go out of business. So Philco quit working with Farnsworth. Farnsworth ended up going toe-to-toe -to -toe legally with RCA to prove that he owned the concept, and he won. But lawyers are expensive, and Farnsworth ended up getting bankrupt by the whole ordeal. Sarnoff appealed and kept the fight in court long enough to invent his own television system and establish the National Broadcasting Corporation, or NBC, and introduce TV as his own. Farnsworth was never able to collect on his invention after the patent expired, so Sarnoff won. I wonder what Farnsworth would say if he saw how his invention evolved with YouTube, video calling, and flat screen TVs. I'm sure he'd be amazed. So, by the 1920s in computing history, we have built a ton of new things using glass and electricity, but there's more to come. And it all starts with the word telly. It's telly time, and we'll talk about major upgrades to the telegraph, the invention of the teletype, the teleprinter, and developments around this and telephone wires. Folks, it's a telefest. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you on the next leg of the journey.